I did want to invite before we begin, if anybody wants to write in the chat why they're joining us this evening, or like what questions you have before we begin, or comments you have before we, we begin, you could put those in the chat. If you don't have any questions up front or don't want to share up front, that's fine because we're actually going to start too with an exercise. Okay. So yes, we oh we do have comments. Oh, thank you. So we have a comment that we need reproductive rights for women and to keep Roe v. Wade viable for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are at a really urgent time. But like I said, the move to undo Roe v. Wade has been there since 1973. It's not really talked about. And I didn't really know that until really doing a lot of my academic studies. Um, more so than even doing my reporting, it was like the academic studies that you see the roots going back way to 1973. But it is true that we are in an urgent time because Ruby Wade has always, has always been a tenuous Supreme Court ruling, uh, but even more so with the recent uh, case of the clinic in Mississippi up before the court. And of course, what's going on in Texas, but more so it's the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case that there is a good chance that Roe will be struck down. If Roe is struck down, I do have this nifty, let's see if I can post this in the chat. I'll try to post links too in the chat, but Good Macker has a good interactive map that if um, the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade, 26 states are certain or likely to ban abortion. Currently, 12 states have trigger laws, which mean that if Roe v. Wade is struck down, abortion will automatically be banned in those states. And for the other states, it'll probably be near either total bans or near bans. But this is a reality that we have been facing for a very long time. That's what we'll talk a little bit about tonight. As we also talk about reproductive ju justice and the difference between like the right to abortion or what we mean by abortion ac access. And we have some other comments. Let's see, and my chat is kind of frozen. Delphine says, how to expand abortion and reproductive justice to be more inclusive of many different bodies. It's definitely true. We have so excited to be here, <laughs> Catholics, talk about reproductive justice, so am I. So I'm here to learn more about how RJ centers racial justice, which we will talk about that, or we can. I have definitely have a lot on that. And we have, I'll protest when the opportunity arises for in support of legal and safe abortions. Majority of Catholics support choice, they need to speak out. Yes, definitely. And that's something that we need to think about as a Catholic community is how we have maybe been complicit um, because we've been so silent as a community. Mm -hmm. Awesome, we have someone who's an abortion doula and a clinic escort. I was also a clinic escort and I would love to be an abortion doula. <laughs> Awesome. Yes, but of course, the destigmatizing abortion. So let's see. Okay. Like I said, I had a lot on the agenda tonight that we probably won't get to everything. <laughs> but this um, is really one of the first times that Call to Action is talking about reproductive justice. We've been talking about it for a while on the Vision Council but have yet to make like an official statement it's been one of our goals so we'll keep hopefully we'll keep this conversation going so if we don't get to everything tonight hopefully in the future we could do more and i would love to bring more people into um the conversation as well but i do want to begin because i have here talking about the dirty a word so abortion is definitely a loaded word not just in Catholic circles, but just in general. A lot of people who aren't Catholics or people that have any religious affiliation also don't like talking about the word abortion um, and also have really strong feelings when they hear the word. So I was thinking that it'd be good to start. And if you have a piece of paper near you or you can write on your computer or on your phone, or maybe you don't have to write it, just think about it. Of course, you could put it in the chat, but I want to get people to like, I'm sorry, I'm a teacher too. I should say that. 
So I'm a writer and a teacher, so I like free writing. So I thought a free writing exercise would be interesting to start off with. And I have these questions that I want us to test our assumptions or our biases about abortion. So I have three questions of what do you think of when you hear the word abortion? Who has abortion? So who do you imagine, you know, when you hear about um, people having abortions? Because a lot of times we speak about this issue in the hypothetical. So who has abortions and why do people have abortions? So I'm gonna maybe put a timer on my phone or just keep track, just a couple minutes. And you can write, if you're brave, you could put your responses in the chat, but you don't have to. This is also for us. So someone says, I think of tension when I hear the word abortion. And someone says, just watch the episode of Maude where she has an abortion, first time in television to pit the discussion. Yes, I believe that is the first time a character had an abortion on TV. And also, you're right, I can't remember if that was right before or after Roe v. Wade. Oops, my timer. So if anybody wants to put, uh, you know, what, what came to mind in the chat, please feel free to do so. If not, it's okay if you thought about it on your own. Mm -hmm. So we have why? Because of sexism, oppression, violence, and rape. Mm -hmm. Or the devaluing of parenting by society and usually falls to the mothers. That yeah, so usually falls to the mothers or the person who was pregnant, became pregnant. Okay, maybe we're a little shy, so I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> oh, got some more in the chat. Oh, that is the correct stat. So someone says, I think the stat is one out of every four women, including middle class. So that is the stat, one out of every four. The first way I asked this question. Oh, good. Now we're getting some more responses. Mm -hmm. 
I'm really impressed by these responses, by the way. <laughs> I'll share that because when I was growing up, um, let's see, I graduated high school in 2006. So by that time, the anti-abortion movement, the Catholic-led anti-abortion movement was pretty powerful. And we're getting hit with a lot of messages that um, women in Europe had like on average eight abortions was one I heard at like a Catholic youth conference. Uh, we're getting hit with like movies, Catholic made movies that were showing women that had abortions and then they were driving around Mercedes and like they were lawyers and apparently that was like, you know, they were so selfish, they had abortions, so they could have a Mercedes type of thing. So, so I was kind of growing up in that climate that women had, uh, you know, went to Starbucks and had an abortion. Um, so I was hit, I hit with a lot of like those kind of, um, kind of gruesome depictions, you know, that it was really selfish to terminate a pregnancy. These responses, I'm really impressed. We had women failing relationships. Too young, too naive, no money. Mm -hmm. Ooh, and that is interesting, Randy. Yes, so now we have some like legal, a birth certificate can't be issued the moment of concession because the number is not known until implantation. Yes, now we're getting to in the legal and the medical side of things, which we can talk about tonight. But I asked this question because um, abortion stigma is so powerful in Catholic communities. And at recent research, and this research that like one article, for example, that I'm quoting here, just from last year, it's published in 2021. And that it's really Catholic communities that have the highest community level abortion stigma. Um, and for example, from this latest uh, research, identifying as Catholic was one of the only characteristics associated with high stigma across all measures. So this was a, a study on community level abortion stigma. And while they found that, you know, evangelical Protestants and Republicans also had like the least favorable attitudes towards support of abortion policies, Catholics had it the most, no matter what the demographics were. So across gender, race, class, political affiliation in the region, that it was always Catholics that had like the highest level of abortion stigma. And I thought that was pretty striking. And that's something that we find in most studies on abortion stigma. And so it's really, um, you know, this is what keeps then the, the shame and silence among people who have abortions in Catholic communities or people that just support legal abortion in Catholic communities because the level of condemnation isolation is just so high. And of course, abortion stigma, how it operates is at the individual, communal, and institutional level. I know we have some great responses in the chat that I'll can get to. And just for some examples of what we mean by abortion stigma. And these are some examples I have at the community level. And this lovely image here of the post-abortion syndrome that says abortion often leaves women with a lifetime of mental anguish. But we know labeling people as post-abortive or post-abortive women, especially without their consent, that's been a new um, move among the anti-abortion movement, but it's been decades in the making of this idea that there's a post-abortion syndrome and they're now projecting uh, this label post-abortive onto women or people that have had abortions, especially without their consent. So for example, I am someone that has terminated pregnancy and uh, people will continue to call me a post-abortive woman, even though it's been, I think, 11 years since I've terminated a pregnancy. So it's kind of like you're always post-abortive no matter what. Definitely an um, example of community level and an institutional level stigma, because this now has become part of counseling services and organizations. Describing abortion as murder. Describing a person as an inauthentic Catholic or not Catholic or a bad Catholic. 
because you've terminated pregnancy or maybe use contraception or support legal abortion. Another one I think is really important to address in Catholic communities, but assuming the person who had an abortion didn't care, was irresponsible, did not view life was precious, et cetera. That last one I've seen happen a lot, uh, assuming that a person who had abortion, um, that they thought that you know it wasn't uh, quote unquote precious, um, that you could spiritually adopt their unborn child or their fetus. That has also been a new move in a, the anti-abortion circle, especially among Catholics. So again, taking agency away from people, but also assuming things about their experience. Oh yes, I could go into at length on post-abortive women and the post-abortive syndromes. There's a lot there and it's um, staggering. And it does go into like the institutional level because um, the medicalization of the anti-abortion movement, uh, which we could talk about, and that is part of my research, it is really driving a lot of these abortion laws. So the tactics have changed from say the 1970s or 1980s versus the 21st century. And we see that not just with the anti-abortion organizations, but also with the bishops. And I could talk more about that as well. Uh, the bishops have megalized their opposition against abortion as well as contraception, right? And this is where we get into some of the institutional level stigmas. But we you know denying Medicaid and other insurance coverage for pregnancy terminations in the US, only 15 states allow for Medicaid coverage of pregnancy terminations. However, you can get Medicaid coverage um, for prenatal care and delivery. So many say that's discriminatory, that we're basing who gets care based off of a procedure. You know, requiring mandatory waiting periods, forced cremation or burials of the remains. Those have been new laws. Um, I don't know if you've heard about those, but many states, Indiana was the first uh, to legislate that what, uh, people that have had abortions must either cremate or bury the remains out of pocket. Um, and then if they don't, then the clinic has to pay for it. Of course, we have the latest Texas law, which allows US citizens anywhere in the country to sue abortion providers and others. Discouraging information on resources on abortion. So that could be a whole range of things. Um, in many states now, uh, people before they terminate a pregnancy are forced to listen to misinformation on the procedure. They're forced to listen to things that say, uh, you know, abortion causes breast cancer, um, which it doesn't, but we know that putting out this misinformation is part of the stigma. Uh, even force ultrasounds or force or have the full force ultrasound viewing, forcing people to look at the ultrasound image before the procedure. Uh, more often than not, that doesn't discourage someone from having the procedure. It just forces someone to undergo more emotional stress. And then of course, the very last one I have here, codifying abortion, whether you had one or supported someone through one or even support legal abortion as an excommunical offense. So we know in the Catholic church that uh, supporting abortion, so not just if you have terminated a pregnancy, but if you've supported someone through term, a pregnancy termination, even if you support legal abortion, the Catholic Church says that you're excommunicated. Of course, there are um, disclaimers to that because the Catholic theology is very complicated. They have some disclaimers. They say that if you were forced under stress or duress, or if you didn't know that abortion was an excommunical offense, then you're not excommunicated. Of course, they keep pushing that messaging, right? So it's a little tough to know, you know when you're excommunicated, when you're not. And also we could talk about excommunication politics, but honestly with the last year with the bishops going after Biden, we're very well aware of this last part. <laughs> yes, yeah, so and we have some, the pregnancy care clinics at Forsman's information. Yes, 
crisis pregnancy centers more often than not are not um, medical offices. They normally don't have medical licenses. Uh, crisis pregnancy centers too often position themselves outside, usually like nearby um, an abortion clinic or a Planned Parenthood, purposely trying to get people to come to their clinics. Normally don't have the medical technology, normally don't provide contraception even. Mm -hmm. Mentioning just wars. Yes, and last year, Pope Francis did revise canon law, right? And while he did slightly increase um, the penalties for priests' uh, sexual abuse, he still upheld that abortion is an excommunicable offense. Does anyone have any questions, by the way, in anything? Or I'm trying to keep up with the chat, but I could keep going. <laughs> also trying to pay attention to the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just looking at the crisis pregnancy centers. There is a lot there at the crisis pregnancy centers. Um, I would love to do like a whole series just taking one of these like issues because there's so much <laughs> and there's so much research for each. Um, but we could go into the crisis pregnancy centers because some of them too have purposely maybe disavowed their religious affiliation. So I'm thinking about there was one in California that is called, I think Aubrey, I'm just making sure. Yes. Am I right in the chat? This is an example of a crisis pregnancy center or an organization, like a crisis pregnancy organization um, that was a, a Catholic organization that disavowed their Catholic affiliation so they could get money from the Trump administration. Um, and they received millions of dollars from the Trump administration. They do not provide um, abortion services or contraception. They do provide, they say, like pregnancy testing and ultrasounds and prenatal care. But what they also do is that they provide um, what they claim is the abortion reversal pill, which they claim is a pill that can reverse a medication abortion. And I have information. Maybe we'll go to that slide on the different types of abortion. And again, another example of the anti-abortion movement medicalizing their opposition to abortion, um, not only by promoting um, kind of pseudoscience like the post-abortion syndrome, but pushing um, the abortion reversal pill, which cannot work. <laughs> I'll just say that, that the research on that is that the abortion reversal pill does not work. But what happens is that these crisis pregnancy centers that are um, anti-abortion, they're trying to hide it and they're getting really sneaky and maybe they don't have religious affiliation. Maybe they had like Catholic roots or other religious roots. Not that being religious is a bad thing, but that they have kind of like obscured a lot of their roots, make themselves look like they're holistic and affirming while also pushing uh, pseudoscience. And of course, not even providing contraception. Oh, yeah, I would love to see a picture of that billboard. If you could, like, I'll give you my email. If you, I love, this is what my research. So send me all, everything you see, every anti-abortion <laughs> image. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I have so much on this. So we might have to do another series on just the ins and outs of some of these, um, maybe the the crisis pregnancy centers, because it, it is pretty, um, I'm trying to be careful of my words, but it is pretty ugly, especially with how they're kind of now glossing themselves. They're get, kind of got rid of some of the um, more overt extremism. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. This is like what I live for. <laughs> but since there may be some people who are also new to this issue, I do have like, here's a, help, a really handy graphic. This is from the Physicians of Reproductive Health. I just sat on a press call yesterday with the Physicians of Reproductive Health, um, 
which was re really great. It was really enlightening. I didn't have time though to transcribe the interview, but I did have a few quotes I tried writing down. But on the press call yesterday, there was a doctor from the Houston area that is an abortion provider in Texas. Um, so they're talking about what they're seeing on the ground. And again, it's very dire. The Physicians Reproductive Health is a great resource. But just in case people don't know, again, you know, when we say abortion, there are so many different types and it bleeds into so many other areas. So we're trying to also understand that reproductive health is a spectrum. Um, but just in case, because I know this has been in the news and some just mentioned medication abortion. So here are two types of um, abortion. We have medication abortion, which um, used to be called like chemical abortion. We try not to say that. Uh, also medical abortion, but the, really the term is medication abortion. And that is when um, we used to call, well, some people still call it the abortion pill, but technically it's two pills and it's available up to 11 weeks of pregnancy. Ideally though, uh, you take it a little bit earlier, but it can work up until the 11 week of pregnancy. This is really important um, because I know the FDA recently, I think in December, approved medication abortion um, pills being prescribed via telemedicine. However, um, it seems like there's a lot of providers unwilling to do that at the moment. But this has been the conversation because of the limited access to abortion across wide swaths of the United States. And so, you know, it is possible to have a safe, uh, it is possible to have a safe self um, termination and it is possible to have a safe medication abortion at home. And it's important for people to know that, but we do need the right, the right information. And then we have procedural abortion, which is sometimes called as an aspiration abortion or a surgical abortion. I'm gonna go back to this slide. And what can be so complicated about this conversation, that's why I wanted to just share some of these medical terms. It's because there's really no like one fixed definition um, of abortion. And what we're kind of hearing when we hear the word abortion is the political messaging, the political rhetoric. And of course we have the Catholic church's definition, which ironically enough, I did not include the catechism on this PowerPoint, but I could pull up the catechism if we need a reference because <laughs> they have a very specific definition of abortion, which is causing a lot of issues, especially at Catholic hospitals. And I do have a slide on that as well. But where abortion gets cut, where it gets really messy is that we have um, really segmented like what abortion is and what abortion isn't. And that has really also been caught in the crosshairs in these laws. You know, and I just have some terms here, like miscarriages is technically a spontaneous abortion. Um, of course, colloquially, that's not what we say, but that's what they would say, you know, what a doctor would say. And so elective abortion is what we know as abortion, but I think elective is abortion is a little bit out of date. So we say procedural abortion now. Then there's also, um, you know, termination of pregnancy or pregnancy termination. And most doctors will say termination of pregnancy or TOP. And this has also been part of the debate. I know this has been debated among people at Catholics for Choice. Do we say the word abortion? Do we say pregnancy termination? Personally, I say both. But it, these are very important because then we also have evacuation of the uterus, which is another phrase commonly used by doctors. And these are all important because we're, we're getting also kind of lost in the weeds and some of these abortion laws and also with Catholic hospitals um, is that people might need a, a, termi a pregnancy termination or a termination of pregnancy for miscarriage management. And so when we say miscarriage management, it's procedures that are taken when a patient's undergoing a miscarriage or following a miscarriage, you know, which may include evacuation of the products of conception or evacuation of the uterus. And at Catholic hospitals, you cannot receive miscarriage management because of the Catholic theology on what abortion is. And then also ectopic pregnancies, Topic pregnancy is when the fertilized egg implants in the fallopian tube, not the uterus. It's not a viable pregnancy. I don't care what some state legislators or anti-abortion activists are saying. You cannot take the fertilized egg from the fallopian tube and replant it into the uterus. 
but some doctor or not doctors, some anti-abortion leaders and state legislators want to do that. And some of these abortion laws have been um, affecting, you know, uh, uh, terminations for atopic pregnancies. And again, I raise this because technically in Catholic theology as the catechism is read now, atopic pregnancies or um, terminations of atopic pregnancies are against Catholic teaching. Uh, in the present day, you could have a termination of atopic pregnancy very easily. They have non-invasive procedures. They usually use either a pill or an injection. The Catholic church considers that a direct killing so they say that is, um, you know, against Catholic theology, it's a mortal sin, and that it's an excommunicable offense. So the Catholic Church says if you have an atopic pregnancy, the proper treatment is removing the entire fallopian tube To me, that makes no, um, makes no theological sense. They're using Thomas Aquinas there in the principle of double effect. But it also makes no sense because if you're removing the Philippian tube, then that person then has decreased chance of fertility. But that's what they say. Okay. Do we have any questions or should I just keep going? I'll keep going. I know we have a lot going on in the chat. Okay. These are also some, I thought this was a handy graphic from the Physicians of Reproductive Health. And touches too a little bit on um, abortion stigma, just the language that we should be careful of. And so for example, the heartbeat ban. So that could be, it's a little contentious. Um, so they say six week abortion ban or near total abortion ban. This is a little contentious. It's, we say heartbeat because I, you know, Semantically, colloquially, I think we understand when you're pregnant and you get an ultrasound, like, you know, the doctor says you want to hear the heartbeat. It's kind of semantically, we, we think of it as the heartbeat, but technically it's, um, you know, the formation of electric waves. And so when they're talking about the heartbeat, they really mean that at six weeks is when we first develop the electric waves that then will form into the heart and the heartbeat. So that's why, like, medically, they would say six week abortion bans or near total abortion ban. We try not to use late-term abortion because, again, that has really been a political construction, not a medical one. Doctors say abortion later in pregnancy or later abortion, that there's no such thing as a late-term abortion. So that was a political creation. Again, trying to use self manage abortion instead of back alley or coat hangers. I understand why we use those strong words, though. And try not to say abortionist, but abortion provider or provider of abortion care. And yes, we're trying to have um, gender inclusive language. It's very easy for the Catholic circles. You could just say pregnant Catholics, very easy. Or Catholics who have abortions or Catholics who use contraception. Okay. Any questions? I feel like I'm talking a lot. No questions? We got a lot of good comments in the chat. Okay, I like these comments. We keep the chat going. Yes, and this is a little more about Catholic hospitals. And again, I think it's worthy of its own session. Um, and I raise this because one, this is gonna be my this is my area of research. <laughs> but two, because I have met Catholics through call to action that feel really passionately about this. And three, because a lot of people don't know. <laughs> I think the, the breadth and the growth of the Catholic um, healthcare system in the US and what it means. But currently one in seven patients do receive care at a Catholic hospital. And the Catholic Health Association is the largest nonprofit hospital system in the US. But Catholic um, hospitals abide by what is called the Catholic ethical and religious directives, which are now prescribed by the Catholic bishops. Wasn't always that way, but since um, around the 1960s or early 70s, the bishops have prescribed these ERDs is what they're called. 
And so if you're going to a Catholic hospital, there are things you can't receive there, or you receive different types of treatments. And usually it's the areas of reproductive health and then the end of life care, which is also very important, right? So we have the reproductive health specifically around um, contraceptive, abortion, and sterilization. And of course, end of life care is also treated differently at Catholic hospitals because they're going off Catholic moral theology. And I have here Directive 45, which is probably the strongest directive that is using Catholic theology um, on how it treats abortion. And as you see here, why I include this. So you see Catholic healthcare institutions are not to provide abortion services, even based upon the principle of material cooperation. In this context, Catholic healthcare institutions need to be concerned about the danger of scandal and any association with abortion providers. And so I'm including this a little bit on Catholic hospitals because if you're at a Catholic hospital and you are having a high-risk pregnancy, you need an emergency termination, you won't be able to get it at a Catholic hospital. A doctor will have to transfer you to another hospital. They will likely not provide you transportation because they want to avoid material excuse me, material cooperation or scandals with abortion clinics. So they either send you to a nearby clinic or to a non-Catholic hospital. And there's still, this area of research is still under examined. There are some really good researchers out there working on this area and trying to highlight the problems this causes. But again, I also wanted to point out here the history of how we kind of we got to this point and why Catholics kind of dominate this conversation on abortion. That it's a very complex history that includes a lot of how our health system has developed in the US, medicalization, uh, you know, public hospitals versus private hospitals, and the abortion movement dating back to the 19th century. I just wanted to point out that U.S. Catholic hospitals initially didn't have a unified ethical code. Um, and then historians have traced how the history of abortion criminalization and the reform movement inspired Catholic hospital administrations to adopt medical codes against abortion. So it's a very complex history when we're talking about abortion, whether or not we're talking inside Catholic circles or outside Catholic circles. You know, because the movement does date back to uh, the 19th century. And so it was actually physicians, what's called the physician's crusade that ultimately led to the criminalization of abortion. And really it's because physicians didn't like that um, there were midwives and that there were doulas who were predominantly women who were performing abortions. So people that were not like professional doctors, right? Obviously because of uh, sexism. And so that is part of the criminalization against abortion. And then it switches to 20th century where doctors then want to provide abortions. And so we have the professionalization of abortion. It's a very complex history. Um, it's a little confusing. But at that time or during this professionalization, um, then Catholic hospital leaders, who at this point were not the nuns, but originally Catholic hospitals in the, in the country did start with a lot of religious sisters. At this point is a lot of men in suits and they did grow concerned over the professionalization of abortion, you know, fearing that it would lead to parents' determinations in Catholic settings. And apparently there were um, parents' determinations happening at Catholic hospitals in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and it led to what some Catholic clergy called geographic immortality. And this is very important when we see what we're up against now, how we have states with wide abortion access where we don't have to worry about um, where you get a pregnancy termination, you don't have to worry about you know, 
you should worry about being at a Catholic hospital and not being able to receive care that you could receive at a different hospital. But if you're in a rural area, a Catholic hospital might be your only um, option, the only hospital, right? And so I just thought it was interesting when I encountered this research recently that Catholic bishops were concerned that there was geographic immortality, that pregnancy terminations were being performed in some parishes and not others. So this was their incentive to create and mandate a unified ethical code. Do we need any stats about who has abortions? I feel like we didn't have too many biases. But I'll just quickly say we have about one in four women. That was correct. More than half of patients already have children or had at least one live birth. I know some people find that surprising. So it's not necessarily being anti-child. It's not people that never want to have children, but if you don't want to have children, that's fine too. Although I know the Pope said that's selfish, right? If you have pets instead of children. <laughs> but more than half of patients already have children and that's very important to remember. Also, some people might find interesting so, and this is according to a good macker um, stats from 2014, but 24% of patients that had abortion uh, identified as Catholic. So Catholics are having abortions around the same rate as, um, well, really I should say around, yeah, like the size of the Catholic population. Although I think the Catholic population has declined a little bit. We've steadily been about 24% of the United States, but I think that has since dropped last year to around 21%, if I can remember correctly. Oh, that's a good question. If these stats include ectopic pregnancies, and I'll double check that. That is a good question. I think they might but I'll double check that. But do we have a hand? Yep, yeah. Janice, would you like to say something? No, I'm sorry, I was going back to your little chart about what to say and what not to say. And, you know, when you say, I think self, if I'm remembering correctly, self-managed abortions, I mean, before Roe v. Wade, women went to you know, non-medical doctors and did go to back alleys and used coat hangers and women in Roman times used poison that they would, you know, poison themselves nine times out of 10. So I just wonder, you know, why the change in the language as far as that's concerned, because that's historically true. That is a good question. And I think why um, a lot of doctors and researchers are advocating um, for not using that type of language is because we also wanna make it clear that you can have a safe self-managed abortion. And so if people hear um, you know, this language, then it might, like, it might scare them. Um, but yeah, and this is kind of like a, I don't wanna say it's a new development because I also think people have been terminating pregnancies since like the dawn of time <laughs> and you know, safely, but also sometimes not, right? Um, but there are ways to have them safely. And so we're trying to get that information out there. But it is really difficult because we also know that if we don't have safe access to abortion, like it does lead to more complications and death. Like, and that's also a true stat that like around the world, like in uh, countries where abortion is totally restricted, like there are very high rates of mortality or complications, right? So it is a tough thing because on the one hand, it is true that it does lead to death and um, injury, but then it could also be very safe. So I think that's why, yeah. It's a lot of balancing of, of this language. Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, the technology since I was, you know, much younger too and paid more attention to, to that in my own life, I think that's the change is that there's more easily or other things available that weren't available back then before Roe v. Wade, which has developed over, you know, the last five, five decades. So mm -hmm. great. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. And it, it is very important because, you know, because of 
not just um well it, it's all the it's all the laws <laughs> it's texas it's um most of the south and midwest it's the roe v wade might being overturned that has led to again cr increased messaging about um telemedicine with, with the medication abortions um but, but it's very complicated too i'm thinking with um the same with contraception and like over-the-counter contraception. So we're having a lot of these complications. I think a lot of it is speaks to not the procedures or contraception itself, but also like the state of the American healthcare system, which actually could kind of lead us into reproductive justice. Um, but similar with like contraception where we want contraception to be widely available. Like personally, I'm not sure how I feel about over-the-counter contraception because the pill can be it could be a lot because it's a lot of hormones, right? Depending on the person, like it's better to have a doctor. However, it's so hard to get a doctor's appointment. It's so hard to see a gynecologist, even if you have health insurance, right? And then we don't really have too many public clinics in this country. The ones that we do have are underfunded. They're overcrowded. We keep the funding Planned Parenthood and other public clinics that provide contraception, you know, not even just abortion, but contraception. So it's like there's a move to make the over-the-counter contraception, but it might not be safe, but then we don't have access to healthcare, <laughs> right? So it comes back to like who has access, right? Which kind of leads us into like reproductive justice. Oh, let's actually take more questions before we go into that. Yeah. That, I think that would be great. I also think you're on a good slide for us to return to Meg's question at the beginning about mm. uh, drawing the lines between racial justice and reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. Could you, since you're on this slide, could you talk a little bit about that? And then maybe yeah, let's take two or three more questions. Yeah, so then we could go into reproductive justice because that is a, it was a black led movement. Exactly. Yeah, so here, yeah, so we have, and this is also from a good map. I'm going to double check at that question too about the good macro stats. I am nervous about this slide though, because I know the conversations that happen on the Catholic left and the, and the pro-life socialists, but so we have class as a factor. So according to um, these stats from good macro, some 75% of abortion patients in 2014 were poor, either having an income below the federal poverty level or low income. So we have then race and ethnicity, white patients accounted for 39% of abortion procedures, black patients for 28%, Hispanic patients for 25%, and patients of other races and ethnicities for 9%. And so, so why I'm nervous about this, but that kind of leads us into reproductive justice. So I can find those slides. Okay, so it is true that if we go by these sets, majority of, oh no, all these slides. Okay, this is also a very good one. But the majority of abortion patients are low income. Why I'm hesitant is because I know in the Catholic socialist circles, there's the idea that if we solve class, like if we solve class oppression, there'd be no need for abortion. Uh, but I do like this quote that was from one of the doctors on the call yesterday that abortion happens in context. And what this means is, and we have this other quote from Dr. Kumar, who is an abortion provider in Texas, that banning abortion does not change the need for access to abortion. And so it is important to remember that are we talking about rights? Are we talking about access and who has access? I'm going back to that question of who has access to health insurance, who has access to safe procedures. And I want to point out here that the US states with the harshest abortion laws are also the ones limiting voting rights, which is super important. Right. And we could, no offense to Texas. I know we might we have Texans on this call, but <laughs> Texas is just one state. So we have the US states with the harshest abortion laws are also the ones who are limiting and uh, undoing all the voting rights, who are targeting people of color. They're also pushing other harmful anti-civil rights measures. And this is kind of what we mean when abortion happens in context. So it's not about abortion only. And I have some other things here too about other countries is that 
abortion functions, I think it functions very differently depending on the country you're in. And it has um, a function in each of these countries. And so I'm thinking, for example, like Ireland or Poland, and we can't kind of uh, neatly compare those countries because abortion is definitely acting, like for example, in Poland, as a form of nationalism or national identity, right? And that's, it is what is happening here as well. And then people terminate pregnancies for many different reasons. So even though, and that's where a good macker, um, why sometimes I'm not like in love with those stats, or I wanna give more context is because um, I think they also usually say um, those good macker studies, usually like economic hardship is the number one reason. Um, and so I think that's where like the Catholic left says if we solve these economic reasons or give more support to single parents or single moms specifically, that they'll end abortion, but that will likely not end abortion um, because it often happens for multiple reasons at one time. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, Delphine. And that's part of it too. So like the same ideologies that also push for um, forced sterilization, you know, it's interesting, like the ones that push for forced sterilizations are also the ones that are anti-abortion because it goes, it goes beyond abortion. It's about consent, it's about control, it's about whiteness, right? And so reproductive justice, I think that should be the next slide. Oh, this is about the Catholic left. We can go back to the Catholic left. I'm happy with this group. <laughs> so we have this term reproductive justice. And this is from uh, the quote here I have is from Sister Song, which is the, the leader of reproductive justice. This term was invented in 1994 by a group of black women in Chicago in the lead up to the International Conference on Population Development in Cairo. This was a really important time. It was around the time that you know, Hillary Clinton said that women's rights are human rights. Around this time, Pope John Paul II, I not include him on this PowerPoint, but he was also making statements to counteract a lot of what was going on, like the women's rights are human rights and the push for uh, reproductive rights on the global stage. He was then releasing his letter to women, which um, you know, denounced abortion, doubled down on it, um, his new feminism, right? So we had a lot about the reproductive rights, uh, but this group of black women in Chicago, which then developed into Sister Song, which is a woman of color reproductive justice collective, which formed then in 1997, they uh, coined or created the framework of reproductive justice, which is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. Yes, I could definitely go back to the Catholic left. <laughs> and I think we should go back to the Catholic left because it's very fascinating. So, and we can imagine what this means for Sister Song, um, or not for Sister Song, for all of us now in 2022 in, in many different ways when they say that it's not just the right to not have children, but have children and parent the children in safe and sustainable communities. And that is very important. Like for example, um, you know, Black Lives Matter has become a big issue with Sister Song. And Sister Song, um, I should say too, continues to be a Black woman-led organization, Southern-led organization, and they're faith-oriented. I feel like that doesn't really get talked about as much, but they are faith-oriented as well. But Black Lives Matter, police brutality, has definitely fallen under reproductive justice. The right to, for black women to have children and to parent children and to have their children be able to you know, live in a safe society and not have to worry about extreme policing. Housing is reproductive justice. Um, I actually have a great book here, which I can put in the chat, Laura Briggs, How All Politics Became Reproductive Politics. And this, tagline is from welfare reform to foreclosure to Trump, right? So when people talk about reproductive justice, sometimes reproductive politics can be in this context. It's not just abortion, even contraception or pregnancy, but housing, public benefits. 
being able to have access to safe housing, to safe communities, to healthcare. But of course, though, we also have to talk about um, pregnancy because in the United States, Black women have extremely uh, high maternal mortality rate, much higher than white women. And in the United States, in some parts of the United States, the maternal mortality rate is on par with developing nations. That is not to um, say anything negative about developing nations. It's just we are a, an industrialized nation that likes to say we're a great nation, we're a high income country, um, and we have some of the worst maternal mortality rates overall. That is, is horrifying. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is part of reproductive justice too, is that if you have the right to, it's not just to not have children, but also be able to deliver your children safely, right? To have access to prenatal care and then safe delivery and affordable delivery. Oh, do we have any questions about this so far? I'm doing so much talking to me. Thank you, Delphine. <laughs> I could just highlight to you a little more, and this is all from Sister Song. I just decided to quote them directly. If you go to sistersong.net slash reproductive justice. So again, though, even though reproductive justice is much more than legal abortion, I am including this because I am a little concerned. I've seen um, some Catholic magazines over the last year, I won't name names, who are writing articles about reproductive justice, but they're leaving out abortion. and I believe that's purposeful because they still want to, um, or they don't want to affirm pregnancy termination. You know, and that's one of the questions we have to think about though, is can we have a reproductive justice framework without also affirming pregnancy termination, right? And so I think this middle one access, not choice. And so, Sometimes I say reproductive rights, but why I say reproductive justice, or I'll say abortion access, although I think tonight I've been saying legal abortion a lot, is because it is really about access. And so as Sister Song has here, mainstream movements have focused on keeping abortion legal as an individual choice. That's necessary, but not enough. Even when abortion is legal, many women of color cannot afford it or cannot travel hundreds of miles to the nearest clinic. There's no choice, so there is no access. And that last part, I know that um, if someone can refresh my memory, I know there's a very famous nun who said something about abortion happens when there's an absence of choice. And I can't remember her name. I feel like her name is Joan something. If someone can refresh my memory. No, I feel like it gets passed around on social media all the time. And so like, I think she's speaking to like a truth there. But what Sister Song is saying here is that if there is no clinic nearby, if you have to travel hundreds of miles to the nearest clinic, if you're living in Texas right now, you can't get an abortion um, with this uh, six week abortion ban. You have to travel to like Oklahoma uh, or maybe Louisiana, but there's only, I, I think three clinics left in Louisiana. So you're gonna to have to travel hundreds of miles. A lot of these states have the mandatory waiting periods. So that requires, it could require multiple trips to the clinic then. So you might have to get a hotel room. That means more money. Well, if you already have kids, that means paying for daycare or getting a babysitter or something, right? So it's not as easy as they led me to believe when I was younger with like a woman goes to Starbucks and then has an abortion. Um, again, not that I think that's a bad thing, <laughs> but there you go, Sister Joan. To the store. Sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Do you want to take some questions? I can also, there we go. We can also meditate. I pulled out this quote from Angela Davis and I can actually put this in the chat. I think it's online. But even though, so I just wanted to highlight this um, this is a classic essay and it's from Angela Davis's book, Women, Race and Class that was originally published in 1981. So like reproductive justice is a new framework. It's not a new theory. Um, and though, even though 
Sister Song developed it in the 90s. We had Angela Davis who was writing about it in the early 80s, right? But this is not really the voice we often hear when we think about uh, the second wave feminist movement or the abortion rights movement. We have, but do we have any questions? I'm trying to also keep up with the chat. Oh man, we have a big long question there. Oh, that's interesting too. Okay, I do like that question about the Catholic social teaching. This question, can you speak more about the difference between, I'm sorry, between what versus abortion? Oh, termination of pregnancy. I think the difference is that there's there might not be, I think it's a difference of semantics. And I think that is, um, unfortunately it's what we're battling because a lot of doctors even, well, it depends on the doctors. So some doctors, like the ones who are on the call yesterday for physicians reproductive health are very, like I provide abortion care. Um, you know, and are really um, bold about it. And the same thing with people at Catholics for Choice and I've worked with Catholics for Choice, like there's always been debates about, should we call it abortion or pregnancy termination? And Catholics for Choice is very much like, right, going use the word abortion. Um, but because of the stigma, a lot of people, including doctors, just do not like the sound of that word. And it comes back to like, who is having abortions, why they're having it and, um, what some researchers have called like the stratification of abortion care. So like, there, unfortunately, because the abortion stigma could be so prevalent that even doctors like at hospitals, maybe not doctors working at an abortion clinic, but doctors at hospitals might not like to say that they provide abortions and they'll say they do pregnancy terminations or miscarriage management. So, but it kind of goes back to ideas about like, who has abortions? Uh, what's a justifiable abortion? And so termination of pregnancy can make it, um, I mean, it can make it a little more neutral because it can make it a reality, right? Because there are those gray areas. Again, if you're at a Catholic hospital, like a Catholic hospital has ethics committees and they won't, um, you know, more often than not, they don't condone uh, a, a pregnancy termination. Um, I'm thinking about a famous case in 2009 where they excommunicated a, a religious sister because she condoned a pregnancy termination when the woman was, was hemorrhaging and dying, right? And she thought she had a moral, like that was the right choice. Um, but they thought, you know, and, and she didn't think, I don't think she used the word abortion, right? So that's why a lot of it comes down to semantics, but it's because that term is so loaded. Lauren, um, I'll do a little bit of moderating so you don't have to moderate chat as well. Mm -hmm. So you saw the question on uh, Catholic social teaching, which for, if anybody hasn't read that, might be summarized by saying, how would a Catholic pacifist, like a nonviolent person, uh, think about abortion and would, would the, the movement be served by looking towards like pacifism and nonviolence instead of trying to make access to abortion? You wanna to speak to that? Yeah. What do we, so that goes, that goes back now to the Catholic left. <laughs> um, so we're, we mean more consistently nonviolent rather than open the door to ways of taking life. Yeah, I guess what do we mean by that? Or what do we mean by nonviolent? Do we have more? Yeah, why I raise this is that um, 
what is little explored, and I didn't really know about this till I had to write a historiography recently, um, is that the anti-abortion movement in the US the, really does come from the grassroots Catholic left movements of the 1960s and 70s. And I hate saying that, but it's been a little ex explored and it's something that I think we need to explore more. And here's just an example. Um, this is Julia Loesch, Pro-Lifers for Survival, No Nukes, No Abortion. And so how a lot of historians have um, put this trajectory is that we had the renewed spirit of uh, back into, which I know here I call it actually we know very well, encouraging Catholics to take an active role in public life, right? And so Catholics played major roles in the civil rights movement and then the anti-war movement, Vietnam. So again, the pacifist movement, Daniel Berenger, right? Berrigan, excuse me. Um, but there was a lot of those Catholics that then led into the newly formed anti-abortion movement. And it was very gra grassroots, right? And so I think this is a good question, but I think that's something I'm still like trying to reckon with too, because I could see the trajectory why you would move from the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement to the anti-abortion movement, right? Seeing it as another civil rights for the unborn, pacifism. Mm -hmm. And it's something, I mean, it's something I'm recon reconciling with on um, that's why I'm wondering what would be, you know, is it focusing on, yeah, I don't know. I want to hear people's opinions because <laughs> it's very difficult. Yeah, Marianne is asking about, um, I don't know if you want to open it up for discussion, but a little bit of a what is happening in um, Texas that you mentioned, and then Delphin is suggesting maybe talk a little bit about Roe of Roe v. Wade. Yes, what is Texas? I unfortunately, so I'm not on the ground in Texas. Um, I would like to be. I would like to uh, be on the ground there because it's um. So you really need to, uh, and I'll put actually maybe some organizations in the chat and some doctors to look up. Like I'll put Dr. Kumar's name. But it is very, it's stressful <laughs> from what I gather listening to the doctor's talk yesterday. Um, it's stressful. It's only been the 140 days. And I say only because it's hard to say like what is going to happen. Like it's kind of hard to say, you know, if there's an uptick in self-managed abortions, if there's, you know, how many people are being denied abortion. It's really difficult when it's only been 140 days. However, these 140 days sounds, has been extremely stressful. Um, it's been stressful for the providers are having to turn away basically every patient that comes to them because six weeks is so early in a pregnancy. Yeah, so I'll try to um, maybe send like, I'll look up like the Physicians Reproductive Health and see. Because the story, I think we really need to uplift the stories of these providers in Texas and the clinic workers, because they are dealing with all the, the stresses. And so I could find too, like some organizations, because we're trying to, um, actually they did say this as well. They don't really have faith. And this I think is pretty typical for a lot of abortion uh, providers, especially in, places in the South and Midwest. I think this has been pretty typical for a while. It's just not having faith in the federal government, not having faith in, of course, the state legislators, but also not the federal government. Um, and so I try to uplift like the organizations and the abortion funds in those states. And then Delphine. Oh, I want to address Marion's first. And that is true. And that's another, I think I had that. Yes. Yeah, so another question or a point I should say is, okay, so the abortion rate is at a historic low. 
I don't know if this is gonna, there we go. The abortion rate has been at historic low. This is from 2017. And so it's just because of abortion laws no, and it is a very weird stat that abortion rates are higher in countries where abortion is illegal. It's a very strange stat, but it's true. And so abortion's been at historic low, likely not because of um, these abortion laws, but because of access to contraception and not just any contraception, but particularly long acting contraception, such as the IUD. And I highly recommend the IUD. I know women of my mother's generation were afraid of the IUD because it was very dangerous in the 70s, but it's better now. <laughs> it's, it's also the best contraception. Um, and it's one of the reasons too why the teen pregnancy rate is also a historic low. Of course, I don't want to stigmatize pregnant teenagers. However, I do wonder because there's just been so many um, Again, there's been so many abortion restrictions for the last 20 years, um, but these most recent ones, I, I wonder like how many people are going to start be turning away though, and that if um, you know if the abortion laws will have this effect. But again, it is also well documented that countries that have um, the harshest abortion bans have higher rates. And then Delphine had a question. <laughs> what is Delphine's? About oh, Roe. Oh, like the actual Roe, the person? I think so. <laughs> How they got used as a puppet. Yes. Yeah. I am interested by her story. Um, that was fascinating. So she was paid. I'm just looking here at the slides. She was paid like half a million dollars, right, by the anti-abortion movement. Um, oh no, it's looking back to the end. It's a very sad story because she was, you know, she was a low-income woman. Um, and honestly, I mean, should I say my personal opinion? I know this is being recorded. Um, like, I'm not mad. Like, I ain't mad that she took that money because <laughs> she was used. Uh, she was a puppet and she was a puppet by both, by both, um, you could say the, the women's liberation movement or the, the reproductive rights movement of that time and then by the anti-abortion movement. And actually maybe Delphine, that does kind of touch upon, you know, Angela Davis does talk about this in her essay, um, where the anti, not the anti-abortion movement, the abortion movement of the 1970s, um, and like it says here, it you know, this distinction between rights and advocacy of abortions. Um, but the stories are different. Like the stories were different if you were a working class white woman, if you were a black woman, if you're indigenous or Latina, like the stories were different than if you were a middle class white woman. And so because the movement focused so much on the middle class white women, right? It's where the stories of these other women fit in. And unfortunately, that is what happened uh, with the anti-abortion movement. It kind of capitalized on, um, on all these women, I think, or people that have fallen through the cracks. And so why a tactic of the anti-abortion movement now is the also protect women, right? So they use a lot of um, slogans now that these laws are protecting women because um, and they, they need to kind of capitalize on the abortion hurts women or we're protecting women. Because if you were, you know, cause it's not always an empowering, empowering up in quotes, like act to terminate a pregnancy. You know, it can be very stressful. It can be, you know, it's not fun if you have to get Medicaid for your abortion procedure. It's not fun in general to deal with like any public benefits in the US because of the system is so broken, right? So it doesn't feel like an empowering um, situation. So that also leads to a lot of like this gray area and people feeling like they don't like fit in on this side, which I then unfortunately I think has led to the anti-abortion movement to capitalize on that. Okay, we're gonna go to 
And she's just some more. This would be a good slide to send to people, just so what do we mean by access? Again, a lot that we have touched on the physical accessibility, the affordability, and the safety, right? And again, the safety could range from protesters and harassment. Um, I mean, it is wild. I don't know how many people here have been to a reproductive health clinic, like a Planned Parenthood or a similar. Um, and also a common misconception is that all Planned Parenthoods provide abortions. They don't, but since Planned Parenthood has been like, you know, Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood, always in the news, that usually a lot of protesters are always outside Planned Parenthood. And it's very stressful. And I know we've had someone here as a clinic escort, but it's very stressful if you're trying to go to your clinic to get birth control or like a well woman or reproductive health screening, and you have to deal with all these protesters. I was a clinic escort in both LA and Boston. And it was just, I mean, there was like a man that would just yell at people, do you want to give your child a birthday? And like, it was just, and these were patients that were going in not for pregnancy terminations, but just to access like a pap smear. Um, and, the, and the danger, it's, it's upsetting that you have to walk through um, metal detectors, I've got the words, <laughs> like to, you know, you have to walk into your doctor's office and go through metal detectors and all this. And of course, the criminalization of patients and providers. That's another thing, speaking of Texas. So providers can be, um, it's criminalization, right? And so providers are worried that they're going to be arrested. They can be fined, sued, and also arrested. But our big challenge is, you know, how do we have an honest, compassionate, accurate, most importantly, conversations about abortion in Catholic communities? You know, how do we bring reproductive justice into the Catholic left and making sure we're not also co-opting it, right? And not um, co-opting the language without also affirming, you know, a full spectrum of reproductive health care. You know, and how do we begin to address kind of like the church's teaching, the church's uh, draconian bans on abortion, other reproductive health care, and the damage that has done. Mm -hmm. And I think too, yes. So we don't really, um, we weren't sure like where everyone was going to be tonight. So don't really have, um, really explicit action items. I am going to post the donate to CTA button in the chat. <laughs> and maybe some other resources, but I'll gladly send out resources too via email. But I was thinking what action items can we take maybe this week, because Roe v. Wade the anniversary is this week um, or in the near future. What materials can Call to Action provide? Like what should we provide going further? Or like which topics do you want to learn more about? And please, I've spoken way too much. So. <laughs>